Hi, I'm Ted Cruz, and today I want to talk to you about critical race theory. Critical race theory, or CRT, is a term that seems to have exploded onto the scene in the last couple of years, and it's taking our schools by storm. That's why I want to talk to you about what CRT is, where it came from, and how to spot CRT concepts in curricula. I know that many of you are planning to run for school board, and I applaud you for doing that. What I plan to talk about today will help you in that process. If you're not running for school board, but you're thinking about it or you're interested just in learning more about CRT, this is for you too. So let's dive in. I want to begin by telling you a story. It's a synopsis of a short story written by Derek Bell, one of the key founders of critical race theory. The date is December 1999. The American people have heard announcements that visitors from outer space, called the Space Traders, will be landing in America on January 1st, 2000, on 1,000 spaceships. When they arrive on January 1st, they announce that they plan on coming back in 16 days and will bring three things with them. Enough gold to bail out federal, state, and local governments in the United States, special chemicals capable of unpolluting the environment, and a safe nuclear engine and fuel to relieve a diminishing supply of fossil fuel. In return, the space traders want only one thing, to take back to their home star all the African Americans who live in the United States. They give the American people 16 days to decide whether or not to take them up in the offer. For 16 days, the American people argue back and forth over what to do. Finally, on January 17th, the very last Martin Luther King holiday the nation would ever observe, it dawned on an extraordinary sight. The space traders had arrived from outer space, and they'd unloaded the gold, unloaded the minerals, and the machinery that they promised. Crowded before their ships were 20 million silent black men, women, and children. As the sun rose, the space traders directed them to leave behind all but one undergarment and then to line up and board the ships. With U.S. guards behind them, there was no escape. Black people boarded the ships, arms now linked by chains, leaving the new world as their forebears had arrived. The story I just told you is deeply disturbing. It's sick and the fact that it was devised by one of the key founders of critical race theory tells you a lot about what Derrick Bell thought about America, about what he thought about the American people, what he thought white people in America would choose. According to Bell, was to send black Americans to outer space in exchange for material goods. That is cynical, and it's twisted. Derrick Bell was a professor at Harvard Law School in the 1970s and the 1980s, when he developed an academic movement along with other scholars, notably Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk. When you look at critical race theory, their names pop up repeatedly. We'll get more into how they shaped critical race theory, but first, I want to delve into how CRT originated with Marxism. So what is the relationship between CRT and Marxism? Well, CRT is to Marxism what branches are to a tree trunk. Marxism views society as a fundamental conflict between oppressors and the oppressed. Karl Marx viewed this dynamic through the lens of class, where the bourgeoisie were the oppressors and the proletariat, the working men and women, were the oppressed. CRT takes that Marxist outlook and teaches instead that race is the lens through which the world must be viewed. It teaches that white people are the oppressors and people of color are the oppressed. In the 1970s, many Marxists became law professors and a group of Marxist professors at Harvard Law School developed what's known as the Critical Legal Theory School. Critical le legal theory teaches that American law favors the powerful, that it's resistant to change, and that it marginalizes groups who are not in the top of American power. It teaches that tort law, contract law, constitutional law, that they're all constructs for oppression. They're all constructs 
for keeping those with capital in power over those without. Derrick Bell, who started teaching at Harvard Law in the 1970s, looked at critical legal theory and decided it didn't go far enough to address race. So he, along with other law professors, developed critical race theory, which takes the Marxist dynamic of oppressors and the oppressed and applies it with a laser focus on race. When you dig into critical race theory, the texts and the interviews given by the founding fathers of CRT, you'll notice very quickly that they have a particular problem with capitalism and with private property. Why is racism so indestructible? One of the things I think is that we have mischaracterized it. We have misdiagnosed it, if you will. For years and years, we thought that racism was an aberration, a defect on the American scene, one that was a holdover from slavery, one that we had the tools to correct through law, and one that there was a desire to correct. Um, and it's taken us a long time to recognize that that was a wrong diagnosis, that uh, racism is an important stabilizing uh, function, serves a, a stabilizing function in a society that is built on property. And in a society where a great many whites don't have any property to speak of, certainly don't have as much as those on the top, what this society has given them from the time of slavery to the present is a sense of property in their whiteness, that their skin color enables them to somehow identify uh, and live vicariously the lives of those on the top. In a book entitled Critical Race Theory in Education, which is a compilation of essays by critical race theorists on CRT's adaption in our education system, essay after essay takes issue with capitalism and private property. The authors of one essay claim that American society is, quote, based on property rights instead of human rights and that the, quote, intersection of race and property is a central construct in understanding a critical race theoretical approach to education. Furthermore, the authors claim, quote, whiteness is the ultimate property, which echoes CRT founder Derrick Bell. Critiques of capitalism and critiques of property have been threads in the CRT quilt since the very beginning and they're still very much at the center of CRT today. In his best-selling book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibram Kendi, a vocal proponent of CRT, writes that, quote, to love capitalism is to end up loving racism. To love racism is to end up loving capitalism. The conjoined twins are two sides of the same destructive body. And that, quote, popular definitions of capitalism, like popular racist ideas, do not live in historical or material reality. Capitalism is essentially racist. Racism is essentially capitalist. They were birthed together from the same unnatural causes, and they shall one day die together from unnatural causes. These are the twisted ideas at the heart of CRT. You know who else hated capitalism and hated private property? Karl Marx. And critical race theory so clearly borrows from Marxism that critical race theorists have explained there is a direct line from Marxism to CRT. What you're looking at is what critical race theorist Tara Yasso calls, quote, an intellectual genealogy of critical race theory. As you can see, there's a direct line from Marxism to critical race theory. Not only do critical race theorists look at American law and American history through a Marxist lens, they also believe the progress of the civil rights movement stopped in the 1960s, and more needs to be done with the subtle manifestations of racism. To address this, Critical race theorists agreed on three main tenets that Richard Delgado, Gene Stefanczyk, together lay out in their book titled Critical Race Theory, an Introduction. 
First, critical race theorists believe that racism is so ingrained in America that it is, and this is a quote, the common everyday experience of most people of color in this country. Second, critical race theorists believe whites are the dominant racial group, which has two effects on American society. Whites, because they, they are the dominant racial group, don't tend to see or don't tend to address racism. So it's difficult to address. And right, whites have little incentive to change things because they're in a position of power. Third, critical race theorists believe that race is a social construct with, quote, no biological or genetic reality. And that, quote, races are categories that society invents, manipulates, or retires when convenient. Furthermore, in their definition of critical race theory, Delgado and Stefanczyk have written that, quote, unlike traditional civil rights discourse, which stresses incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. Let's unpack what they mean by this. They're very clear that instead of addressing racial injustice with the kind of progress that led to the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment, and the progress that the heroes of the civil rights movement achieved, we need to instead abandon our premises as a country based on authentic liberalism and enlightenment thinking. They're saying that the idea of equality and neutrality in law are obstructing racial justice, not leading to it. Based on what critical race theorists have actually written, it's apparent that critical race theory has a serious problem with the United States of America and with the philosophical foundations on which our nation was built. So how did CRT go from a fringe theory debated in law schools to an element of K through 12 education and curricula? And why now? Well, a few things have happened. We've had serious racial tensions in our country throughout our history, but especially following the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. With the New York Times, the 1619 Project has emerged, setting off great debates about the history of our founding. And we're coming through a pandemic where schools were closed, where children were taking classes at home, which enabled parents to suddenly overhear what their children were being taught. I want to dial in for a moment on the 1619 Project because it is critical race theory at work. The 1619 Project is a series of articles written for a special edition of the New York Times Magazine, led by journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones. In the words of the New York Times, the 1619 Project, quote, aims to reframe our country's history. Nicole Hannah-Jones starts started the 1619 Project by writing, quote, our democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. And, quote, conveniently left out of our founding mythology is the fact that one of the primary reasons some of the colonists decided to declare their independence from Britain was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Despite complaints from renowned historians about false claims in the 1619 Project and multiple corrections by the New York Times, Nicole Hannah-Jones, amazingly, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2020 and is now going to be teaching at Howard University. The 1619 Project espouses the view of American history that CRT embraces. And one of its articles was even entitled, American Capitalism is Brutal. You can trace that back to the plantation. But despite the 1619 Project's manifest errors, it's being taught in schools in Washington, D.C., in Buffalo, in Newark, in Chicago. In Buffalo, New York students in grades 7 through 12 have been taught the 1619 Project since February 2020. And the Chicago public school system is teaching the 1619 Project using curriculum guides you see on screen from the Pulitzer Center. 
There's no question that all students need to learn about the evil of slavery, about Jim Crow, about the horrible racial discrimination we've had in our country. But to reinvent the story of the American founding from 1776 and the birth of the United States and to characterize slavery as the beginning of and the heart of America is to distort what America is all about. On top of all of this, left-wing teachers union bosses are also aggressively advocating teaching CRT in schools. Just this year, the National Education Association, the largest teachers union in the United States, adopted a platform that states the National Education Association will push critical race theory. The National Education Association will, quote, provide an already created in-depth study that critiques empire, white supremacy, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, -indi not an easy word to say, racism, patriarchy, cis-heteropatriarchy, God, I can't stand leftists when they make up words, capitalism, ableism, anthropocentrism, whatever that is, and other forms of power and oppression at the intersection of our society, and that we oppose attempts to ban critical race theory and or the 1619 Project. Publicly, through existing media, convey its support, this is the NEA speaking, for the accurate and honest teaching of social studies topics, including truthful and age-appropriate accountings of unpleasant aspects of American history, such as slavery, and the oppression and discrimination of indigenous, black, brown, and other peoples of color, as well as the continued impact this history has on our current society. This, the association will further convey that in teaching these topics, it is reasonable and appropriate for curriculum to be formed by academic frameworks for understanding and interpreting the impact of the past on current society, including critical race theory. The nation's largest teachers union is saying they want to teach Marxism to our kids starting in kindergarten. So how can you spot CRT concepts in K through 12 curricula? There are a lot of buzzwords thrown around like white privilege, intersectionality, systemic racism, collective guilt, and even spirit murder. But today I want to focus on one word in particular, equity. Equity sounds like a good thing. Equity sounds like equality, but it's quite different. And the difference is this, according to critical race theory, equality means equality of opportunity not equality of results. CRT teaches that in order to obtain equality of results, we need to discriminate. We need to affirmatively and actively take race into account when it comes to policy. What does that mean? Well, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibram Kendi says, quote, the defining question is whether discrimination is creating equity or inequity. If discrimination is creating equity, then it is anti-racist. If discrimination is creating inequity, then it is racist. CRT is teaching our children to embrace discrimination. Furthermore, Kendi says, quote, to be an anti-racist is to view the inequities between all racialized ethnic groups as a problem of policy. That's why Kendi thinks we should pass a constitutional amendment to set up a department of anti-racism, which would, quote, be responsible for pre-clearing all local, state, and federal public policy choices to ensure that they won't yield racial inequity, monitor those policies, investigate private racist policies where racial inequity surfaces, and monitor public officials for the expression of racist, racist ideas. Think about that for a second. A federal government agency of unelected bureaucrats 
having the power to set aside any law elect, passed by elected representatives, whether at the federal level or at the state level or the local level. A federal government agency of bureaucrats in Washington having the power to silence, censor, and punishment anyone who says anything contrary to what they dictate. You see, to critical race theorists, in order to achieve equity, local and federal governments must discriminate so that the same results are achieved by all races. And if policies don't meet that standard, CRT defines them as racist policies. The truth is, equality is one of the founding principles of America. It's embodied in our Declaration of Independence that powerfully declares we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, to be sure, the United States hasn't lived up to that promise of equality. But that promise was laid out in our founding document, and it has been a journey towards that ideal. We fought, fought a bloody civil war to eradicate the grotesque evil that was slavery. And if you look at the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendments that were passed after the Civil War, they are fundamentally about equality, about equal protection under the laws, and about everyone having the right to vote. Equality is a beautiful principle that America is champion to the entire world. There's no doubt that the United States has been imperfect. But the concept of equality was essential to our founding, and it is an ideal worth aspiring to. Critical race theorists disagree. They reject equality. Instead, they demand equity. And equity necessitates discrimination in order for everyone to achieve the same results, regardless of effort, regardless of what they put into it, they demand equity. As CRT proponent Ibram Kendi says, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. That's what CRT wants, present discrimination. It's what they want to teach our kids. In school curricula, equity can be used as a catch-all term to explain why all white people are racist. This is what CRT teaches. Even white babies. In a, quote, equity toolkit released by the Arizona Department of Education, a flyer explains that babies as young as three months display a racial preference in who they look at. By five, the equity flyer states, quote, black and Hispanic children in research settings show no preference towards their own groups compared to whites. White children at this age remain strongly biased in favor of whiteness. What utter nonsense. And some CRT diversity, equity, and inclusion consultants are making a fortune off of the taxpayers to promote their perverse vision of equity in the school system. The Eanes Independent School District, which is right outside Austin, Texas, paid $170,000 in taxpayer money to a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant for a year's worth of consulting. And Manhattan Beach schools in California have likewise hired outside diversity, equity, and inclusion consultants who are paid for by what's called social inclusion grants. As you prepare to run for school board, or even if you're just a conservative who's interested in what critical race theory is, why it's dangerous. It's important to look at the definition of terms like equity. Not only do they pop up in critical race theory texts, but they're used by school board members and in teacher trainings. So arm yourself with facts. Well, critical race theory concepts have infiltrated our education system. Most Americans still don't know what critical race theory is. A recent Reuters poll found that 50% of adults don't know what critical race theory is. Another recent Economist poll found that those who claim to understand what critical race theory is think it is, quote, bad 
for America. Ain't that the truth? What this shows is that most people don't know what CRT is, but when they learn about it, they don't like it. That's cause for encouragement. Furthermore, Rasmussen recently reported that 78% of likely voters think it's important to teach traditional values of Western civilization in school. So not only are most Americans not familiar with what a critical race theory is, when they learn about it, they don't like it, and a large majority of Americans want traditional Western values taught in our schools. That's where you come in. As more and more people like you research what critical race theory is and develop a, a working knowledge of how it's being used in schools across the country, I believe we can activate and effectively push back against it. And we're starting to see what can happen when conservatives stand up and act. In South Lake, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, conservative parents rallied together to defeat a ridiculous critical race theory initiative that a local school board's diversity committee had put forth. The conservative parents were able to band together to fight this. And they got three times as many people to show up and vote in the school board elections than usually vote. And guess what? They won the school board elections about 70 to 30, a massive margin. That's what happens when we have grassroots leaders like you pushing back against critical race theory. Critical race theory is based on lies. It's based on the lie that America is fundamentally and irredeemably racist. It's based on the lie that all white people are racist. And it's based on a false history of our nation that characterizes everything as a battle between the races. Critical race theory divides us based on race. It teaches hate and it advocates discrimination. Critical race theory is the antithesis of the vision that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. laid out standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial when he said, I have a dream, a dream of a nation where my children can play with the children of another race and they can be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's who America is. The America that was embraced in the Declaration, the America that was embraced in our Constitution, the America that Dr. King envisioned from the steps of the memorial. America is not the lies that are taught by critical race theory. And together, standing up for common sense for the values that built our nation, we can defend against our children being taught hatred and discrimination and lies. Thank you and God bless you.